Friends, Psalm 147 reads, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is, a, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Friends, let us stand at this time and offer our praises to God through song. So. Do not be anxious. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You are not of more value than they, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For these Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious, anxious for itself, sufficient for of the days in its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. This is my father's word, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Thanks, Josh. That was nice. Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to day two of Weekend in the Word. Glad that you're with us today. Um, our speaker this weekend, um, we learned last night, has been uh, in and out of trouble with the law. Uh, so, involving poultry. So, 
And if you missed last night, you're just going to have to, you know, ask a neighbor or a friend uh, what that's, that's all about. So uh, just a great, great time. Craig uh, served as um, associate pastor here at Clear Lake Presbyterian Church from uh, 1996 to 19, or to 2004. Is that right? And uh, his wife, Nancy, also served on staff um, as one of our pastors from 2000, the year 2000 to 2004. And since then, they've moved to uh, Spokane, Washington, where they um, pastor at the Millwood Community Presbyterian Church. And uh, Craig and Nancy have been sharing about their, uh, their experience of a year-long experiment uh, with some limits on it, with some rules that they, uh, four rules that they had. And I was struck as we read that song about that phrase, that God is the ruler yet. And uh, so we have some more good learning today, and I'd like to open us in prayer as we uh, begin our day. God, thank you uh, that though the wrong seems off so strong, that you are the ruler yet. Uh, we awaken uh, to this day that is already half over, uh, that you have been at work through the night uh, in the beginning of the day, as, as uh, Craig spoke about last night. And so we come into a day this morning at which you've already been at work, and we seek to join up with the thing that you are doing. And so, God, tune our hearts to your voice as you speak through it to us through Craig and Nancy, that we, we might uh, hear your call and know your love and uh, be more fully your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, give a round of welcoming applause to Craig. I see someone left me some chocolate chips up here. Is that someone who read the book? There, there was an experience we had, like uh, we had a big Costco-sized bag of chocolate chips at the beginning of our year, and uh, I surreptitiously was going and grabbing handfuls of them, and I uh, got found out, and uh, <laughs> they hid them from me the rest of the year. Well. Uh, uh, let me just say, I am so grateful uh, for, uh, uh, this, this is what I've heard from you all in talking to you. Everyone has said, uh, we just have the best staff. The, everyone just says, um, uh, in fact, you, you say, the, the, what I hear you saying is, uh, boy, we've never had a better staff. <laughs> now, I don't. I don't take that personally. You know, I. I agree. You've you, you've upgraded. Uh, but I just I keep hearing the best things about Steve and about Rachel and Josh and about Daniel and Katrina. I'm so excited about her ordination, uh, Reverend Katrina. Uh, now, I have to take some credit for that because when we were in between youth pastors, uh, I was the one that called Katrina and, and said, hey, would you think about coming on staff here? And so anyway, I just uh, am so grateful, especially for Steve as the head of staff of the church, just opening up and inviting Nancy and I to come back and be with you. What a great gift that is to us. Well, this weekend, the theme is, uh, you know, we had this year of following these rules and confining ourselves within these limits. And out of that experience, one of, the, uh, one of the joys that we discovered, sort of surprisingly, was that, uh, that in these confined spaces and in these limits, there was this wonderful new life that we discovered. There was this wonderful, there were these things that we discovered that without forcing ourselves within that space, uh, we would never, we wouldn't have discovered those things. We wouldn't have arrived at that. And what I said last night is that uh, really we had stumbled into an age-old lesson of the Christian faith and the church and, and a life of spiritual formation. And that is that, uh, that in the history of the church, the wisdom has been that if you want, to, you want to learn what it's like to follow God and to pay attention to the work of the Spirit and to walk in the steps of Jesus, the way we do that, the, the path that we follow is to establish meaningful boundaries and meaningful limits. 
Uh, and uh, someone mentioned, I was talking to someone last night, and they said, well, I, <clears throat> there are all kinds of limits, and some of them seem uh, rather arbitrary and meaningless, and certainly we can all acknowledge that, that, that we, we find ourselves in these confined spaces that, uh, that aren't helpful and don't make sense at all. So I'm not just celebrating all limits, uh, but I am suggesting uh, in, in kind of this tradition of the church uh, and uh, kind of hearkening back to uh, the, the wisdom of the centuries is that, that there's an opportunity for us in a meaningful way to, con to create uh, limits that, that allow us to get on board with what God is up to in our lives and in the world that without those limits, we can't do. And so it's counterintuitive. We, we live our lives wanting to shed limits. We, uh, we live in a, in a culture that, that celebrates the myth of unlimited, unlimitedness uh, and in time and in uh, resources and whatever it is. But as I, as I read last night, we start from the very beginning in Genesis and we, uh, we hear this description of the, the boundaries and limits of creation this created order. And then uh, we're invited uh, to engage and embrace that creation through the practice of the Sabbath, which is this limit, don't work. And so uh, what I want to do today is I want to continue with that theme. Uh, and I want to share a story uh, very early on in the year uh, of what it was like living in those limits and how uh, in some way, we felt like we were kind of stumbling onto holy ground in doing that. And what I'm going to do is share about the, a birthday party. Uh, and some of you have read the book. And you say, oh, I love the, the birthday party. It's my favorite story. Uh, and really, in some ways, it, it's our uh, favorite story, too, about uh, Noel has a December birthday right around Christmas. And so we always celebrate it in January. And we set these rules. And if you weren't here last night, uh, we decided to live for a whole year purchasing everything locally used, homegrown, or homemade. And so uh, everything that we purchased had to go through that filter. And uh, we didn't think about a whole lot of things. We, we, uh, we didn't plan well. And one of the things that we didn't realize how hard it would be was birthday parties. And we had a little test case of this. Uh, uh, Noel was going to a birthday party for an eight-year-old boy. And... Uh, try to figure out a birthday present for an eight-year-old boy that's local, used, homegrown, or homemade. I mean, it was, we, I don't know what you do for birthday parties and, and for kids, but we have a 15-15 rule, and that is, it's $15 and it takes 15 minutes to get it. <laughs> and you, you know, you do it, get it over with, but when it came to get this birthday party for an eight-year-old boy, uh, it took half a day to find the gift. We ended up buying this handmade uh, little box from a store in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho that specialized in local artisans and, and it cost twice the normal uh, $15 rate. And so we were, learning, we were learning, wow, this is uh, challenging. But then it came time for Noel's birthday. And all the, think about all the expectations on, on a birthday. Uh, and I, I don't know when the theme thing kicked in for birthday parties for little kids, but I mean, it's a production. And they're kind of, it's not only the kids that bring gifts for the birthday person, but you, you have gifts that you give to the kids who are coming to the birthday party. So uh, we, uh, it, it was a big, I, I would say it was an early test of our resolve to actually do this. It would have been so easy just to sort of, throw these rules to the side. And Noel, of course, she uh, unknowingly made it a lot more complicated than we ever could have imagined. She said, I want, you know what I want for my birthday? I want a pinata. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, we could probably figure out how to make a pinata. You know, you do a balloon and put paper mache around it and we'll hang it by a, a, a rope or something. And she said, no, I, I want a flamingo pinata. <laughs> and I was trying to think about it. Well, okay, a flamingo, okay, we can do that. You know, I'm a, a dad wanting to make her daughter happy. So go ahead and show the picture uh, 
Okay, so there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and note that we, we had to, uh, we couldn't go to the store and buy the fixings for a uh, flamingo pinata. We were taking toilet paper rolls and like duct taping them together and uh, going, we were taking off the, we were just taking whatever we had in the house and using it uh, to make the pinata. So yeah, go ahead and stop at that slide. So. We, uh, uh, we figured it out. And that was actually one of the joys. It, it was difficult. I'd never done paper mache before, but we took flour and mixed it and, and uh, covered our flamingo pinata with newspaper. And I'm gonna read a little bit of our account of how this whole thing went. And I'm gonna pick it up at the moment. It was about an hour before the birthday when we were waiting, anticipating for the paper mache to dry so that we could then, and what you do is you pop the balloons on the inside. And this is what happened. It was our moment of truth. Noel poked into the bulbous torso, and as the balloon slowly deflated, the wet walls of the paper mache stuck to the balloon, <laughs> pulling inward like a little universe collapsing on itself. <laughs> With only an hour till her friends arrived, Noelle was distraught to see her prized pinata looking like a crushed tin can. So I'm talking about the body part down there. That's where we were planning on putting the candy. She, she said, Daddy, what are we going to do, Daddy? And she went out of the room crying with tears running down her cheeks. Uh, our five hours of work and preparation were literally collapsing before our eyes. It was a catastrophe. A daughter's simple wishes for a good birthday crush. A father stuck in the worst kind of night before Christmas toy assembly nightmare. <laughs> and a mother too stressed out about her made from scratch birthday cake decorated with leftover Halloween candy to pay much attention. <laughs> Just a few weeks in and the wheels seemed to be coming off our little experiment. But something happened on our, oh, let me read this little part. It's worth noting that a flamingo pinata would be no big deal in some households. There are families out there who make flamingo pinatas that not only dry with time to spare, but are beautifully decorated with pink feathers and handcrafted beaks made from native plants. There are dads who are skilled, so skilled and excited about this kind of family project that they install a small motor so the flamingo can flap its wings <laughs> as children take a Louisville slugger to it. And, I, uh, and that's kind of the community we're in here, isn't it? The NASA community. <laughs> you guys would probably have solar panels on it, and <laughs> probably attach it to a rocket and shoot it off. There are moms who have never used a Betty Crocker cake mix and don't need to use leftover Halloween candy because they make their own candy from the honey they harvest from their own backyard apiaries. If you haven't figured it out, we are not that family. <laughs> We're that other family. The one that lives on the edge of household sanity. But something happened on our way to a disaster. We came up against a moment that, we would be, that would become a routine part of our year, a moment when we were forced to innovate and roll with the punches and adjust our expectations. We had always dreaded these moments. We had them long before we jumped into this experiment and we did our best to avoid them. But as the year progressed, we came to look forward to them as a push to get creative and improvise. improvise. And so that's what we did. Uh, and uh, basically, let me explain what we did. Uh, uh, the, the body was sort of a lost cause, and so uh, I, I called Noel in, and I said, Noel, I'll tell you what, the head had dried for some reason. We didn't reinforce that one quite as much. Uh, I popped the balloon there, and so I brought Noel in, and I said, Noel, this is what we'll do. We'll stuff the body with newspaper, kind of plump it up, and no one will ever know the difference. And we'll, we'll take the candy and we'll put it in the head of the flamingo. And she sort of, she sort of went along with that. And uh, so I cut a big hole in the head and we put the candy in and taped it over. Uh, of course, we didn't have time to decorate it. <laughs> and so go ahead and go to the next slide. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, and not only did we have time to decorate, we never really thought how we were going to hang the thing, so it's hanging from its neck there. <laughs> And you can see the head sort of flopped over because it's got all the candy in it. Uh, and the kids are preparing there to, to take a whack at it. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, it, it was quite a scene. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just I'll pick it up from there. The party went surprisingly well. The cake was a hit and the homemade pottery bowls made for a fun project and party favor. When the time came for the piñata, I tied a rope around the neck of our forl forlorn flamingo and hung it from the banister. As the kids lined up to take their shot at the hanging effigy, they looked like some kind of juvenile ninja training class. <laughs> the blindfolded kids took their turns at smashing open the head. They were totally unfazed by the creature. And it really, you can see it was a creature and went at it like any other pinata. The ridiculousness of it kind of created this infectious giggle in the room. After a couple times through the line, one of the bigger kids took a huge swipe that made a pure connection and the head went flying across the room, <laughs> leaving the long neck of the deceased bird holding up a limp body. With a big cheer, kids piled on the dismembered body part and grabbed the candy. I looked on at the gruesome scene with kind of a twisted pride. <laughs> the first ever eight-year-old birthday flamingo decapitation. <laughs> go ahead and go to the next slide. There they are. Go ahead and go to the next one, too. There it is. <laughs> It was a proud moment. <laughs> At this point in the year, we were working with more of a fourfold motto than a fully formed moral compass for our lives as consumers. But what was quickly being unveiled was the hidden pattern of consumption that had been driving us all these years. We had been operating out of a sense of scarcity, scarcity of time and money, scarcity of energy, emotional availability. We woke up every morning feeling the burden of these scarce resources and were driven by this, shaped by this perpetual shortage. Like there was some hidden embargo somewhere that mucked up the works. In his book, Divine Economy, Theology and the Market, Stephen Long says that our basic forms of economic life are based on models of scarcity, that they actually demand it and create it. By contrast, he notes the Christian God operates from the perspective of plenitude and abundance. He asserts that the Christian story offers up an alternative way of living, drawing from the deep well of God's abundance. He writes, God's inexhaustible plenitude suggests that we need not try to consume creation as our own. We need not cling to creaturely life nor seek to flee from it. Instead, it's it its desires can be properly ordered. This plenitude invites us to learn to participate in God's own perfections, in a simplicity of life that rejoices in cooperation and gift rather than in conquest, competition, and acquisition. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I think I have that quote. So we're invited to learn to participate in God's own perfections, in a simplicity of life that rejoices in cooperation and gift, rather than conquest, competition, and acquisition. Simplicity is not the first word that comes to mind as I reflect on Noel's birthday party. It was exhausting and complicated and incredibly inefficient. But it did arise from the simplicity of life that rejoices in cooperation and gift, as opposed to the complexities of acquiring items across unfathomable supply chains. It was based on the simplicity of a household economy of time and skill and using what was at hand. It, and it did seem properly ordered, with parents and children elbow to elbow splattering goo on each other living in the wonder of unchartered, shared experience. Uh, the other path was like a well-oiled machine that parents around the country had perfected in an effort to pump out a smooth birthday celebration. 
we were discovering the importance of proper complexity. So I, I, I think of it as intentional inefficiency. <laughs> Later that evening, after we'd swept up the carnage from the day's events, I asked Noelle how she liked her party. She spoke glowingly about the whole affair, and without any prompting, she exclaimed, my favorite part was the piñata. And I think she had in mind not just the joyous chaos of the flamingo head flying under the living room coffee table, but all the time we had spent preparing, the precarious moments of uncertainty that we had endured together, even the inconvenience of the whole thing, it had gathered us together. It caught us up in a different kind of family story where money and time are not oppressively in short supply, where she is not a cog in a family machine, but as Wendell Berry puts it, a child who belongs to the world of love. So, so out of this sort of confined, inefficient kind of, we created all these limits that forced us, and this is one of our key learnings from our year, is that these, these limits that we placed on our lives, it forced us to pay attention to each other in our family, and it forced us to rely on each other in a way uh, that, that was new and different. Uh, and, uh, as I think about the need in our lives for meaningful boundaries and limits, as I think about the wisdom of the history of the church and saying, uh, well, uh, you know, if, if we're called, as Jesus says, to love our neighbor and to love God, uh, a big part of both of those, and especially what we were learning with our family, a big part of learning to love each other and to love our neighbor is to rely on each other, to pay attention uh, to each other. And so we were learning that, and uh, th those lessons, uh, uh, they came in wonderful ways. One of the things that I mentioned last night that we lived with one car for a year, and uh, there was one morning where we missed the bus, and so for some reason I think Nancy was gone and there was no car to take, and so we were forced into one of those kind of creative moments again, and we realized, we said, well, why don't we walk? to school. And our house is, an, uh, is a mile from the school, and it goes down a hill, uh, about 500 feet in elevation. Uh, and we had never before thought about, you know, we drive, you drive to school, you don't walk. Uh, and, and the church is an hour, or, uh, I'm sorry, a mile past uh, the school. And so we set off that day, and it turned into this great adventure. And we uh, the next day, the kids said, can we walk to school again? And we were walking down the street, and one of the other neighbor kids had missed the bus, and she came running around the corner, and she said, can I go with you? And so we, we went another half a block, and then some other kids were coming out uh, of their door, getting ready to drive to school, and they said, can we come with you? And so it turned into this walking school bus, and, and we... Uh, <laughs> And it became the great tradition of the year, that every day that we could, we walked. And I mean, the, I think about those moments, uh, you know, a good 15 minutes of quiet, talking, uh, paying attention to what's going on. It was just a, it was a wonderful way to start the day. And for me to then uh, have an extra mile to walk by myself before the day started and to just be in that quiet. There was just this wonderful ability to, to pay attention that, uh, that uh, was really difficult when our lives were very efficient and driven and, and less complicated. Uh, and so I want to invite Nancy up to share a little bit of her experiences in the way that we were drawn together as a family. I'll start off by saying, yesterday, if you weren't here, I mentioned that um, I was going to take on the challenge of, um, of wearing some of the things I wore during our year that were um, either bought at consignment stores or thrift stores, the Goodwill, or uh, were hand-me-downs, or I had them for over seven years, um, or things that were given to me. Um, today, I'm wearing my first thrift store purchase. Um, this is my first dress, and the kids, I know that when they see me in this, they just have an immediate memory of that year, because I wore it a lot. Um, and uh, this 
is from our farmer's market. A woman there made it, and then um, that's offered. And then later I'll wear um, some pants later on tonight that I wore, I bought on the same day I bought this dress at a, a thrift store. But that exercise two nights ago, I was kind of hard, it was fearful, it was terrifying to think, they're gonna be looking at me this whole time. Um, but I, um, it brought me back, when, as I was looking at my closet, um, it brought me back to um, this kind of motto and mindset that I had the whole year, which was, um, the, the limits that we had, it forced me to think, okay, instead of saying, I don't have this, I don't have that, I, don't, I wish I had this, I wish I had, it brought me into this new perspective of, okay, what do I have? What are the blessings I have been given? What can I work with? And, and, and so that, that was with clothes, as I, you know, scrambled every Sunday morning, especially as I'm trying to uh, dress for church, but then, um, then in the pantry, what do I have to eat? What do I have? I mean, yes, we were able to buy some food items, but for a lot of the time, there were recipes that I didn't have the ingredient. And I'd think, well, what, what could I put in its place? What do I have? Um, with all of our stuff that we have, when I thought, oh, I really, sh I need that, I need that. Well, what could I use instead? How long can I make this tinfoil last? <laughs> Got a little tacky at times, but you know. Um, but then, then it, I mean, it, it went beyond that to relationships. Um, my kids, my husband, um, you know, instead of thinking, okay, Craig is leaving his dishes by the, you know, on the couch where he watched TV, he's doing that again. Of course, I'm only using that as an ex I, I made that up just to, <laughs> I just help it to have a visual. No. Um, but instead of thinking about, about that, oh gosh, he never does, or he does, blah, 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 to think, oh my goodness, I have this husband that has brought us onto this adventure, and life is so good, and we, we were able to connect in this way, and, and all the, the ways, especially that party. Uh, Craig is so good at stuff like that, and thinking, like I would be, like, pinata, ah, you know, um, I'm not very crafty, <laughs> if you hadn't. Forget that out by now. I'm not very domestic, even the cooking and all of that. Um, it was great to see Craig enter into these ways that I knew that he was gifted in. His mother's a potter. His mother can make anything. I mean, she has made most of her, all of her window treatments, all of that. Um, he has a real creative bent. But it was until we were forced into this that I really saw it. And so Craig, um, um, well, I'll, I'll move in. Um, to something else that made me think of. Um, last night, I went out with a bunch of girlfriends for Ra Rachel Jenkins' birthday. Happy birthday, Rachel, again. Um, and the question came up, as it does, I've done a women's retreat, and this, you know, other speaking engagements, this always, this question is always here from the women, usually. Um, the question, didn't all of this burden of this year fall on you? And actually, that's one of the first things that I brought up in that conversation with Craig that night. Hey, um, <laughs> okay, it's a similar Christmas scenario thing. Um, just to remind you, Craig, I said, um, I I'm the shopper, I'm the cook, I'm the one buying the birthday presents, and, you know, so isn't this all going to fall on me? Um, yeah, local used, homemade, homegrown, easy for you to say if you're not connected to all that. So, but, but no, at the, he said, and I trusted him in this, he said, no, we're in this together. This is our family, we're in this together. We talked to the kids, what do you think about this? We're in this together. And it was a wonder, and so my favorite part, probably about the whole year, was this family togetherness that was unique. To, we hadn't lived in these ways. That birthday party, us all getting our hands in the goo and mix, you know, them helping me with the cake and was figuring out even what we were going to do for that cake. Um, just coming together as a family um, was an amazing gift, amazing gift. Um, Craig was the ice cream maker. He made the butter. We made butter in our cuisine. Um, we, uh, he also took on the role. I said, I can't do the birthday parties. I was too stressed out about not 
not Noelle's birthday, but um, the birthday presents for other kids. I just, I said, can you just take that piece? And he did, and that was great. Um, so I, I that, that was a tremendous gift, being in on this. Uh, the one thing I, the one scenario I envisioned was, um, I said, Craig, if I show up with a, a turnip, an onion, and a carrot for dinner, like how are you guys going to respond to that? So they're all, we're all, we're okay, okay, we're all okay. I, I innovated a little more than that, so. I wanted to also share a little bit of a crisis of the limits for me. Because it's not all, yay, we're such a family, wonderful. There, I had some real um, things to work through. And I'm going to share a little bit of those a little later as well. But the qu whole question of what do people think of me in this, that, that picture, I didn't even think of this one, Craig, when, when the, the parents were dropping off their kids and they, they saw that flamingo hanging there, they were like, what are they doing in here? I mean, just, and then it, it doesn't, they don't think anything of Craig, they think of the mom who puts on the party, you know? question, oh, our, this isn't the way it's usually done. What are they thinking of me? When we tore out our lawn, and people are probably assuming we're going to plant new lawn because ours was so weedy, you know? But no, it just stayed like dirt for a long good while. What in the, what are they doing? Um, when the snack list for the school, for the classrooms go around, and they've read this, our, our story was in the paper. And, and they go, oh yeah, don't give her the snack list. She can't hold her weight. She, she can't buy the Coke, you know, she can't buy the, the soccer, whatever it is. And, um, and so I just wondered, are we just the weirdos? Are we the weirdos of the community? Um, and, and this was a, a telling, this was a real one, a big one for me. Um, the day came when Lily's shoes, her tennis shoes, they were just, her toes were protruding out of these shoes. Um, thrift store tennis shoes. You know, if they look good and they look like they haven't been used much, there's a reason why they're on the shelf. They just feel weird. They're funny. They're weird. Um, so that was so hard. Later on, I actually did put tennis shoes, girls' tennis shoes, on medical necessity. Uh, just to, but um, at the time, okay, so we bought, uh, we had Crocs. Where did they come from? Someone gave them to us, grandma or something. Those Crocs, you know those? Crocs, shoes, okay. Um, the weather was right for these Crocs and she loved them, wore them every day. I don't know how she did PE, but she wore them through PE. Um, and th but then came time for a fun run at school. The fundraiser, and it's a run. And Lily, and the girls love running, they really do. And they, um, so it was coming and I was stressed about the shoes. I said it was because, oh, you can't run in Crocs. I mean, your feet, you're, you're going to hurt. It's going to be a, what was I really thinking? All of those moms are looking at the weird, the, what, what's with the girl in the Crocs? Can't the mom, you know, buy her some shoes? So, um, so I looked and I looked and I brought her to this thrift store and I brought her to this and I tried to, and I'm like, are any of these made in Thailand? Where are the shoes made in Thailand? And I couldn't come up with anything. The day came and I just, okay. We're going, and she's like, Mom, I love my crocs. I can run in them. I'll be fine. So like, okay, we'll go. And so I'm, you know, sweating it. But she, there Lily was, just running and just so happy. And in her crocs, I asked her each time, how are your feet? How are they? Okay. You know, and, uh, she was fine. She ended up winning. She won. She ran the most laps, got finished first, got the big prize. And there was so much joy uh, with her, and I just, oh my goodness, a joy within me. And, and for me, it was a huge lesson in, um, in just, just relishing in the joy of the moment. Who cares? Who cares? Isn't it most important that she had this great time and she was comfortable and all was right in the world with her? It was her mother that was having the issue. And, and so the lesson for me was, you know what? This is our family. And you know what? We're quirky. We're goofy. And that is so okay. That is so okay. 
Comparing ourselves with others. Me comparing myself with other moms and other families. Do you know how toxic that can become? Do you know how far that can take us away from God's will in our life if we're looking, you know, how am I doing according to you all? Um, and there's this realization, um, you know, if we live content with what we have, um, where we are at in the, in the place that God has for us, what a testimony that can be to the world, that, that God is enough. God's given us enough. We have enough uh, with God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Um, if you live in that contentful place, that's, that, that's what it speaks to, um, a, a real faith and trust in God. So that's what I, um, that's what I wanted to share from this time. Just to piggyback on what Nancy was saying, we were learning that uh, the efficiencies of our lives and, the, and living up to the social norms around us, they in many ways are designed to keep us from running into each other, to keep us from seeing each other as we really are. And, and these rules and these confined spaces, uh, they were um, helping us to run into each other as a family uh, and to see each other and, and for others as well. Uh, so if we want to think in two trajectories that, that uh, these confined spaces, they help us connect with each other in love, but they also help us to connect with God. Uh, and that is the, uh, and those are the, if we think about uh, limits in the Christian tradition, like fasting and and. Uh, prayer at certain times of the day and the Sabbath, like I talked about last night, uh, uh, that is a big part of how these limits work in our lives. And I want to read, I'm going to read the introduction uh, to spring and the ways that we were learning to uh, listen and pay attention to God in the midst of this. Living within the culinary confines of winter root crops, I have never been so attentive to the slightest hints of spring as I was during those first months of 2008. It was a hard winter with record snow and biting cold. Spring was taking its sweet time to arrive, so in the middle of February, with no sign of resurrection to be found, I took matters into my own hands. I ordered a used electric heater on eBay and put it in our small six by eight foot greenhouse. I crunched my boots step by step through a foot of snow to fill the greenhouse with our first trays of seed starts. In Spokane, the traditional last freeze date is May 15th, and most seed packs offer instructions about starting seeds indoors a certain number of weeks before the last freeze date. Most seeds are best started six to eight weeks before this important date, but I was unfazed. This year, the best time to start seeds would be 14 weeks before <laughs> reaching the seasonal milestone. I thought I could sneak around the limits of the seasons, length of days, soil temperatures, hard freezes, long shadows from a low slung sun. I attended to these realities initially only in as much as I wanted to overcome them, to contort them to my timing. My creative energies went into how to get around them and get a leg up. But I learned that year the lesson I learn every year, only harder. These boundaries can be stretched and fudged, but they cannot be overcome. They are boundaries beyond my control, marching forward at their own mysterious pace. Efforts to fool the seasons in a particular place always end up making us the fool. I put my starts in the soil well before the last freeze date. Instead of growing in the warmth of my optimism, they sat shivering in the near freezing soil. They looked up at me in their hypothermic state and asked, why? <laughs> Plants don't grow just because they have water and soil. They grow in a complicated interaction of soil temperature, length of days, direct sunlight and moisture. Without the proper mix of these factors, the plants just sit, sometimes rotting or freezing, but never growing. As the futility of my efforts to grow food set in, I began to take a different perspective. My view shifted and my attention turned to what the spring thaw offered up. 
instead of what it disallowed. With these new eyes to see, I noticed the wonder of rhubarb bursting out of the ground. Do any of you know rhubarb? And it's like the first thing, it's like a creature coming out of the... Uh, not far from my suffering plant starts were what gardeners called volunteers. Here I had been forcing my will on plants like a garden tyrant, conscripting a fearful population of early season vegetables, when from every corner of the yard there were volunteers coming forward of their own free will, cilantro, dill, chives, and dandelions. <laughs> yes, dandelions. They are a tasty source of fresh spring greens that I've proven I can grow year after year. <laughs> This crop is a good confidence builder for any gardener nursing his wounds from a fickle spring. <laughs> In March, when I was on dinner duty, I wandered the property and gathered a bounty of the green serrated leaves, tossed them in an early spring salad that consisted of locally sprouted mung beans from Idaho, matchstick carrots from a nearby Green Bluff farm, and dandelion leaves from cracks in our driveway. <laughs> the true test was to see how the girls responded to eating weeds. Noel said, it kind of has a zing to it. <laughs> Lily commented, it kind of makes you perky, but it's really good. As we made the first transition from one season to the next, we were learning to pay keen attention to nature. And not just to scheme and contrive a way around it. We were learning to see gifts where there had once only been inconveniences. We were learning that life has certain immutable rhythms and that there is unexpected joy in letting creation lead the dance. As Jesus puts it, consider the lilies. Tune in to the smallest details that point to the biggest truths. Creation, creator, created. It's probably no coincidence that Jesus chose among the earliest and most tender of spring wildflowers to highlight God's glorious grace. Lilies put on the most elaborate of displays, breaking the dull drone of winter gray and announcing the certainty of the turning of the seasons. More broadly, Jesus is saying, consider the glorious springtime before you plant and harvest and make the world in the heat of summer. Remember that the world was made and you are caught up in the drama of the making. To borrow Noel and Lily's words, this new attentiveness has a zing to it. It's uncomfortable and confining, but it's really good. It kind of makes you perky. <laughs> Go ahead and put the next slide up. So consider the lilies. Uh, that that uh, lesson for me has taken on new meaning. Uh, one of our family projects is that we have set out to try to take a picture of every wildflower in the inland northwest. And so Noel and Lily and I will go out on adventures. Uh, and, and so it, it has that project. Uh, we went through it one summer, and then I was waiting for the flowers to come in the spring, the, the following spring. So I was paying keen attention, and I, uh, and that's when I learned that lilies are at least where we live, which is kind of high desert. And I'm assuming where uh, where Jesus was, it, it would be similar. Uh, that uh, the really the first flower to emerge, first notable flower is this flower. It's, um, it's known as uh, the, I guess the Latin name, Fritillaria pudica, yellow fritillary. We just call them yellow bells. Uh, but there, it's like there's nothing. And then all of a sudden this delicate, just beautiful uh, little yellow bell pops up. And, uh, and, and I just, I remember how excited we were. It's like, oh, wow, look. Here, here it is, the first flower of the year. And ever since kind of going on that journey with the yellow bell, Jesus' words, consider the lilies, have taken on new meaning to me. The, the sense that we are called um, not to uh, sort of barge our way over the boundaries of creation, but that, we're, that, that God calls us, and, and part of what Jesus is saying when he says consider the lilies, he's saying pay attention to the work of the Spirit around you and expect and know that that, that work will emerge. Uh, uh, don't, don't buck against the, the boundaries of these seasons. Go ahead and go to the next. Uh, last night I put up a stop sign uh, and the, that, that says, consider the lilies means slow down and pay attention. 
And that's one of our big lessons uh, of these rules and uh, these confined spaces is that they uh, forced us to slow down and pay attention to each other, uh, pay attention uh, to the God's good creation. And ultimately, I think uh, the, the, the history and tradition of uh, the limits that we set, meaningful limits on the spiritual journey, they are designed to help us pay attention to what God is up to. I, I recently met a, uh, a, a fairly well-known photographer from New York. His name is David Vessel. And I, I was at a uh, um, university, and uh, through a set of circumstances, I was in this pottery studio, and it, I felt like I was in an artist commune, probably the closest I've ever been to, an, to a, a group of artists like that. And this photographer happened to show up. And, uh, he uh, is an older gentleman, and I, I really like photography. And I asked him, I said, so how do you decide what to take a picture of? And, uh, you know, I thought he, maybe he would have some technical things to say about the light or about the setting. Uh, and he said, uh, basically, well, whatever, whatever I feel like taking a picture of. You know, I thought, oh, a well-known photographer, and he just kind of randomly goes around and and takes pictures, but he said this, and this quote has really stuck with me. He said, um, I, you know, I just kind of whatever grabs, whatever grabs me. He said, things get interesting when you pay attention. So this photographer with an artist's eye, who all those years, I mean, he'd had this long career of taking pictures, and he developed a sense that, uh, I don't have to make stuff happen, all I have to do uh, is pay attention, and things get interesting when we pay attention. Uh, uh, the, our, our sense of what God is up to in the world gets really interesting when we pay attention. Our family life, our relationships, they get really interesting when we pay attention to each other. And so that's, the, uh, that's kind of the encouragement for this first session is is that practices and limits on the spiritual journey, they help us to slow down. And we're gonna take a 15 minute break right now, Connie, is that right? Am I, is the timing right or do I have another 10 minutes for? Okay, um, I, what I wanna do is uh, let's have us um, break into groups and I, I want you to, to, last night we kind of talked in general, what, what rules would you come up with? I want you to think up one rule that would help you to slow down and pay attention uh, to, uh, and, and I'll let you choose, but uh, something that would slow down, that would help you to slow down and pay attention to the people in your life that are important. Or what's something that could help you slow down and pay attention to what God is up to and the work of the Spirit in your life. So it's a rule that would help you to slow down. Okay, so let's go ahead and break into groups and we'll talk about that.